Good evening. I'm Daniel Green, president of the Newberry Library. I'm delighted to welcome you to the second program in the David L. Wagner Distinguished Lectureship Series with Professor Jonathan Lear. The Newberry supports and inspires research, teaching, and learning in the humanities. We've been free and open to the public since 1887. The library's doors are open to readers and visitors. You can visit our website, newberry.org, to make an appointment to do research in our reading rooms, or you can drop by the library without an appointment Tuesday through Saturday afternoons to see our two fall exhibitions, Renaissance Invention and Decision 1920, A Return to Normalcy. The Rosenberg Bookshop at the Newberry is also open Tuesday through Saturday afternoons, and you can always shop online at our website. For the safety of our community, our public programs remain virtual for the time being. Visit Newberry.org to learn more about our many digital resources, online classes, and virtual public programs like this one. During this program, please enter questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments section if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube. Jonathan Lear will answer questions at the end of this talk. The David Wagner Distinguished Lectureship in Humanistic Inquiry was established by the late David Wagner and his wife, Rini B. Adams. Professor Wagner was a true friend of the Newberry. After earning degrees at the University of Michigan and serving in the Navy, he taught medieval history at Northern Illinois University until his retirement in 2003. Professor Wagner's primary interest was in medieval philosophy and education, and he was motivated by asking an enduring question. What does it mean to be a person, to be a human? In 1987, David Wagner came to the Newberry to teach grad a graduate seminar on the seven liberal arts in the Middle Ages. And he told us that that course was one of the highlights of his career. His wife, Rini Adams, who's watching this evening, is an accomplished artist who taught at Indiana University and whose works are included in the collections of the Art Institute of Chicago, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and here at the Newberry Library. We're deeply grateful to David and Rini for endowing this lectureship and for entrusting us with this legacy at the Newberry Library. Today's program is one example of the Newberry's civic commitment to public education and intellectual engagement, bringing together communities of scholars, students, and the public to discuss ideas that matter in our world today is central to the Newberry's mission. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Lear. Jonathan Lear is the inaugural holder of the distinguished David Wagner Lectureship in Humanistic Inquiry. We're honored to welcome him back to the Newberry. Professor Lear is the John U. Neff Distinguished Service Professor at the Committee on Social Thought and in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Chicago. He's also a practicing psychoanalyst. Since 2014, he's been the director of the Neubauer Collegium, a research institute that brings together scholars from the University of Chicago and around the world to explore problems of serious human concern. Professor Lear has published 12 books in philosophy, wrestling with philosophical understandings of the human psyche, and with the ethical implications that flow from us being the kind of creatures we are. His work has ranged widely from the philosophy of Aristotle to the work of Sigmund Freud, and from the worldviews of Native American tribal communities to exploring how irony and its contradictions are vital to our humanity. Tonight, he delivers the second of three lectures in this series titled Transience and Hope, a return to Freud in a time of pandemic. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Lear. Well, thank you so much, Danny. It's uh, great to see you and uh, great to be back in, in so far as I can be back giving the second lecture. Well, one day when I was six years old, I got in the back seat with my sister and our parents drove us up to visit our grandparents. When we arrived, there was a party going on, lots of grown-ups dressed up. My grandma, Jenny, came over and she bent down and told me that her father, my great-grandfather had gone off on a long trip. I barely knew who he was, and I had no idea why she was telling me this. A moment later, an older cousin walked over and said, he's dead. This is the moment I realized that uh, adults lie to children. Now, why do they do this? Well, they don't all. There have been cultural shifts, and my sense is that these days, adults try to be more honest with their children. Still, this moment is worthy of attention. My grandmother was not a reflective person, and I suspect she acted from an ingrained habit that expressed a cultural norm. Officially, the norm was to protect the children, in this case, from a knowledge that would be too much for them at their age. 
But what knowledge is that? If my grandmother had said he died, I doubt I would have learned much. What I did learn a moment later when my cousin spilled the beans was that the topic of death was treated by adults as dangerous, taboo, and forbidden to children. I'm not here interested in my grandmother's psychology, but rather in a shared cultural imaginary of which she availed herself. In acting as though there is some adult knowledge um, from, one, from which one needs to protect the children, one tacitly reassures oneself that one has something, namely the knowledge that is not to be passed on. But what knowledge is that? The cultural norm of protecting the children serves to protect the adults from recognizing that in this painful and important moment in life, they understand little or nothing. Being, adult, being an adult so understood thus involves playing the role of adult. And it also allows the gratifications of childhood play. When my grandmother said that her father had gone on a long trip, I now wonder whether she was soothing herself by expressing her fantasy that in playing the adult, she was at the same time able to return to something comforting from childhood. Perhaps her parents had told her that a grandparent had gone on a long trip. The fantasy may have been passed on through generations, the very words passing from adult to child without anyone particularly noticing. Perhaps my grandmother was inviting me to join her in play a transitional space of cultural experience in which we tacitly understand that the question of whether he is really on a long trip is not to be asked. And ironically, it was a child, my older cousin, who destroyed the play space with the intrusion of this thud-like reality, he's dead. Now, what makes this vignette worth considering? In part, it's the reversal of roles between children and adults at least when it comes to familiar cliches. In this scene, it's the children who are able to face reality and talk about it frankly, and it's the adults who live in a childlike fantasy. But there is more. We, rec we recognize also that Grandma Jenny is getting something right in turning to imagination and fantasy in response to the death of a loved one. And her imagination tends in the direction of reassuring herself and perhaps others about the stability of the world in the face of death. Her father might be gone, but we are still here. And the idea of a long trip presupposes stability in time and space. For something to be a trip, one must be able to get from here to there. So here needs to remain stable enough for us to imagine it as a place of departure. And the idea of a long trip is meant to be a comforting image of immortality. Somehow, life goes on in a happy enough circumstances, however vaguely understood. And in short, we get to comfort ourselves about both here and there. It is this background stability that has come into question in the pandemic. We cannot experience a loved one on a long trip if temporality itself comes into question. But the coronavirus has infected our sense of the future. In normal times, a sense of the future is implicit in everyday life. But in a time of pandemic, the future becomes uncanny. It's like peering into the fog. And if we turn on the high beams, it only gets worse. Perhaps there will be a vaccine soon, and we shall quickly look back on the pandemic as a momentary blip. But perhaps COVID-19 will never go away. Perhaps it will change the shape of warfare forever. Perhaps historians will look back with curiosity at a time when total strangers sat in close proximity to each other to eat meals in places called restaurants. Perhaps it will transform human life on Earth. Are the political and social institutions in whose midst we live stable or not? What will happen to our treasured values, values we live with in the present, but which by their very nature direct us towards the future? Values as our unfinished business. Are they finished? Of course, life is always uncertain and the future always holds surprises, but uncertainty is now much more closely present to mine, present in our sense of the present. Imagine a future generation looking back on us and telling our story. Here's the rub. We cannot really do that. 
at least in any way that does not immediately seem to be one person's fantasy. We can imagine the narrative beginning. They lived in a time of pandemic, but then what? The pandemic has destroyed any shared illusion about how the future will unfold continuously from the present. And insofar as the meaning of our present is shaped by its future significance, the sense of the meaningfulness of the present must come into question. This, I believe, is a source of anxiety that we feel. In these extraordinary times, our ordinary practices become a matter of anxiety for the culture as a whole. So, if I were six years old today, I would not be able to get in the car with my parents and drive to my grandparents. I would not be able to enter a crowded room of adults talking with each other up close. How would Grandma Jenny tell me her imaginary story? On Zoom? Would my cousin break the news to me via the private chat function? This is by way of saying that not only can we not easily see into the future, the past does not seem to give us guidance about how to live in the present. We can no longer simply come together to mourn the dead, nor can we simply come together to be with the dying. Sometimes we are forbidden to do so. People die in hospitals and in hospices in isolation, and they're on their own. We are haunted by images of dead bodies piling up that suggest a horrific prospect for society not being able to cope. One of the primary functions of any culture is to help its bearers bear death. The culture does so in part through rituals of mourning that are meant to give meaning and thus to contain death as a phenomenon of life. But right now, the liveliness of these rituals has come into question. The meaningfulness of the meaningful world has come into view in its fragility, and that makes us feel fragile. In these difficult times, I want to return to a three-page essay Sigmund Freud published just over a century ago in 1916 called On Transience. I have long thought it a classic, but the pandemic has transformed my sense of what this essay is about. It presents itself as a kind of philosophical essay in the broad sense of that term, speaking about a phenomenon, transience, that marks the human condition. When it comes to us, transience is not itself transient. But I have come to think that this essay self-presentation is just the surface. The essay now seems to me to be a profound struggle with the psychic consequences of living through world catastrophe. In short, this essay is about our time in a way I could not have understood until I found myself living in our time. Now, although the one must read the essay from beginning to end, I have come to think that the best way to understand it is from back to front. Narratively, the story moves in a linear fashion from earlier to later. It begins with a nostalgic reminiscence of the re recent past. Not long ago, this is a quote from Freud, not long ago, I went on a summer walk through a smiling countryside in the company of a taciturn friend and of a young but already famous poet. Now, the poet and Freud have a disagreement about the meaning of transience in human life, and that takes up most of the essay. The essay concludes a year later in the author's present, as well as the present of the intended reader, that is in the midst of World War I Europe. I have come to think that world catastrophe is not the denouement of this essay. It is the problem that haunts it from the beginning. The official presentation of the story is that Freud happened to hit upon the timeless philosophical topic of the meaning of transience due to a conversation that arose on a walk. This presentation now seems to me misleading. Freud is grappling with how to live in the midst of world catastrophe and with the radical uncertainty of the immediate future. In particular, can the structure of values which has shaped our world survive even unto tomorrow? Thus, in our times, I think we have reason to go back to Freud and take another look. Freud is writing in the midst of war. Here is how he describes the situation. It is the penultimate paragraph of his essay. Quote, my conversation with the poet took place in the summer before the war. 
A year later, war broke out and robbed the world of its beauties. It destroyed not only the beauty of countrysides through which it passed and the works of art which it met on its way, but it also shattered our pride in the achievements of our civilization, our admiration for many philosophers and artists, and our hopes of a final triumph over the differences between nations and races. It tarnished the lofty impartiality of our science. It revealed our instincts in all their nakedness and let loose the evil spirits within us, which we thought had been tamed forever by centuries of continuous education by the noblest minds. It made our country small again and made the rest of the world far remote. It robbed us of very much that we had loved and showed us how ephemeral were many things that we had regarded as changeless." Unquote. When I read this passage before the pandemic, it looked as though Freud was ruefully bringing to our attention that under the destructive pressures of war, even the achievements of art, science, and civilizations show themselves to be fragile and transient. But now, as I reread it in the midst of pandemic, I see that Freud is also, and importantly, suffering a loss of a piece of himself. And he invites his readers to recognize that they are undergoing a similar psychic fate. To be sure, war destroyed the countryside beauty and art before it. It, quote, robbed us of very much we had loved, unquote. That is horrible, but we know that war does that. But as he puts it, quote, it also shattered our pride, our admiration, our hopes. It tarnished, as he puts it, our sense of science's loftiness. It revealed severe limits on what the, quote, noblest minds can teach. Now, I used to read this without pause. Now I find it surprising and in need of explanation. It is one thing to be grief stricken or depressed or enraged by the destruction of great art and great beauty. It is quite another thing to have our pride, admiration, and hopes shattered. How could that be? There is something personal here, not just that one is personally affected, but it somehow has to do with who one is. Freud is ashamed. He says that the war showed us that how ephemeral were many things that we had regarded as changeless. But that alone cannot explain shattered pride. It must have been that somehow we ourselves were invested, not just in these cultural achievements, but in their being eternal or changeless. Freud's narcissism, our narcissism perhaps, seems to be entangled in an illusion that civilization is itself an endless journey, a long trip in a civilizing direction, one that moves towards peace and mutual understanding in which increased knowledge is a civilizing force, and reason and creative art promote social and psychic harmony. On this image, civilization opens indefinitely into the future and in the direction of the good. I think in this context, we can understand why, what Freud means by war tar tarnishing the lofty impartiality of our science. War does not show scientific results false, but it does destroy the illusion that science facilitates peaceful progress for all. And it shows how science is used to destroy civilization. Freud thus admits a twofold illusion. First, that civilization is an endless progressive journey. And second, that by participating in that journey, I can take pride in myself because I have been partaking as best I can in something eternal or endless and good. Disillusion comes as a blow to one's sense of self. Shattered pride means I was implicated in the illusion, not simply because I participated in it, but because I identified with it. And here is the wishful kernel that until this blow of recognition has been part of Freud's self-conception, that if I hitch myself up to civilization, I thereby partake of eternity. Only thus could my pride be shattered in the recognition that eternity does not come with the bargain. And there is also room for the embarrassment in recognizing one's complicity in maintaining this illusion. After all, 
European culture has been riven by wars for thousands of years. Works of art and monuments to culture have been destroyed again and again through the ages. How could it be that we have a comforting belief that we have somehow arrived at a turning point where civilization at last gains the upper hand over our destructiveness? And I am reminded of a more recent time, just after the fall of the Berlin Wall, when Francis Fukuyama published his book, The End of History and the Last Man, to great popular acclaim in magazines and journals. How could it be that over and over again, we take ourselves to be at a culminating point in history, only to be disappointed again? There is a repetition here. And in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, it is a good time to take another look at it. Let me give a summary of where we have come so far. First, the coronavirus pandemic intensifies our anxiety about the future, and in particular, about the stability of our shared social, political, and cultural institutions. Second, I have suggested we go back to Freud's attempt to analyze the world catastrophe of his time. Third, in a time of world catastrophe, one may suffer psychic damage that is difficult to recognize as such. World catastrophe threatens one's sense of self by exposing vulnerability in values, the values in terms of which we have been trying to understand ourselves. Our values are drawn from socially available meanings and meanings display their fragility in times of world crisis. So, while the transience of world structures and civilizational achievements may be on our minds, what is haunting our musings is the actual transience in the here and now of our own psychic well-being. We anticipate mourning the end of the world, but are confused about how to acknowledge a lost or damaged part of ourselves. Now, Freud does not explicitly discuss that psychic change of living through world catastrophe in on transience, nor what it would mean to mourn it. Nevertheless, there is much to learn from him here because he enacts it. If, as I have suggested, we begin at the end of the essay with Freud's shattered pride and admiration and the tarnished sense of the nobility of science with which he had identified, all in response to a world catastrophe, we can then return to the main body of his essay and read it as an active attempt at intrapsychic mourning and psychic repair. So let us now go back to the beginning of Freud's essay. Quote, not long ago, I went on a summer walk through a smiling countryside in the company of a taciturn friend and of a young but already famous poet. The poet admired the beauty of the scene around us, but felt no joy in it. He was disturbed by the thought that all this beauty was fated to extinction that it would vanish when winter came, like all human beauty and splendor that men have created or may create. All that he would otherwise have loved and admired seemed to him shorn of its worth by the transience which was its doom." Unquote. It is all but certain that this summer walk never occurred. The editors of the Standard Edition tell us that Freud went on vacation in the Dolomites in August of 1913 but they know nothing of a poet or a friend. A number of scholars have pointed out that Freud did meet a famous poet a month later in September, but that meeting took place in a city, in Munich, and in the midst of a fraught Congress of the International Psychoanalytic Association. This was the occasion of a break between Freud and his hoped for protege, Carl Jung. To put it mildly, Freud had a lot on his mind and there was no smiling countryside or other natural scene to admire. Lou Andreas Salome wrote in her journal that she was able to introduce Freud to her friend and lover, Rainer Maria Rilke. Quote, this is from, um, from Andreas Salome, quote, I was delighted to bring Rainer to Freud. They liked each other, and we stayed together that evening until late in the night. Now, on the basis of this Munich meeting, scholars have suggested that Rilke must be the famous young poet, and that Andreas Salome was the taciturn young friend. And one scholarly strategy has been to deploy literary and historical research to figure out what that conversation might have been. And I think this does lead to fascinating results, but tonight I wanna to take a different tack. I suggest we forget about Rilke 
and Andreas Salome, and we, that we abandoned the idea that there was any meeting, whether in the Dolomites or in Munich, that was the meeting we need to get clear about. Rather than follow Freud's narrative, which is fiction, I have suggested that we begin with the psychic devastation recorded at the end of his essay. We should look back to the beginning of the essay as a retrospective attempt to contain the anxiety. The you know, young poet is better understood not as corresponding to any real figure in the external world, but as a figment of Freud's imagination. And importantly, this figment of Freud's imagination is also a fragment of his imagination. The poet is a partial figure lacking in nuance or complexity. From this perspective, which I'm trying out tonight, it is a mistake to try to fill out the picture with a more textured sense of who this poet was or what the conversation might have been. As a figure of Freud's imagination of his inner world, it is the caricature that matters. The fact is, the purported argument between poet and Freud, taking it at face value, is a shambles. The poet comes across as an immature and arrogant prat, taking a dramatic stance, refusing to take any joy in beauty for the sake of the drama, one for which his sole reason is the transience of all things and for which he gives no further explanation. It's more like a debating position or a stance. And for his part, the Freud of the story, the I that's in there in the story, is an equally one-sided figure on the other side. Here's his description of himself, quote, but I did dispute the pessimistic poet's view that transience of what is beautiful involves any loss in its worth. On the contrary, increase. Transience value is scarcity value in time. Limitation of the possibility of enjoyment raises the value of the enjoyment. It was incomprehensible, I declared, that the thought of transience of beauty should interfere with our joy in it." Unquote. Incomprehensible? To be sure, there are things in life, for example, a great dinner with friends, that we enjoy in part by knowing that the evening will eventually come to an end. But ask anyone who has declined to enter a relationship because they did not think it would last. Later in the essay, Freud acknowledges the terrible pain of loss, but the I who appears in the conversation with the poet is a thoroughly unambivalent figure. This is not a thoughtful engagement between two serious people about the meaning of transience in human life. It is a polarized standoff between caricatured figures in Freud's imagination. Neither stance is nuanced or insightful about the position of the other. They're simply opposites set over against each other. The poet is characterized by his refusal to take joy in transient beauty. And the Freud of the debate is the opposite take it up with the thought that the transience of beauty is the source and justification of joy. This polarized standoff makes perfect sense if one thinks of this in the aftermath of the disillusionment that Freud describes himself as having undergone. Freud has just lost an organizing principle of his life, the image of himself as participating in civilization's long trip and thereby partaking of eternity. And what emerges is this divided structure, a you know, sort of debate in which no matter which side you are on, you do not rely on the fantasy of civilization uh, going on endlessly in a progressive direction. Note too, that if the kernel of the underlying anxiety is about the fragility of civilization, then the whole scene of a nature walk is a projection outward to a place most unlikely to raise the issues of anxiety that are genuinely at stake. Put yourself in the mindset of a European intellectual at the beginning of World War I and ask yourself, is there anything in the world that seems more permanent, more intransient, more unlikely to be harmed by human destructiveness than the Dolomite Mountains? If by contrast, Freud had set this conversation in a cafe in Munich, the conversationalists might well be led to wonder whether these precious cafe conversations might go out of existence, whether indeed cities might survive. And these are not unlike questions we are asking ourselves now. And the poet's explicit concern 
if taken at face value, was close to preposterous. He is reported to be, quote, disturbed by the thought that all this beauty was fated to extinction, unquote. But what he means is, quote, that it would vanish when winter came, unquote. In short, he is talking about the lilies of the field in a high altitude remote dolomite meadow. True, those lilies will die come winter, but is there any stronger image of permanence than the eternal cycle of nature in which lilies return each spring? The poet allegedly makes the connection to the human, quote, like all human beauty and splendor that men have created or may create. But if we take seriously the background of catastrophic destructiveness of world war and its immediate and anxious threat to civilization, the poet's picture seems rather wishful and upbeat. After all, lilies will come back in their splendor. And I'll return to that in the end of this talk. Freud gives a diagnosis of what is going on with the poet and his friend. Quote, these considerations appear to me incontestable, but I notice that I have made no impression either upon the poet or upon my friend. My failure led me to infer that some powerful emotional factor was at work, which was disturbing their judgment. And I believe later I discovered what it was. What spoilt their enjoyment must have been a revolt in their minds against mourning. The idea that all this beauty was transient was giving these two sensitive minds a foretaste over mourning, over its um, decease. And since the mind instinctively recoils from anything that is painful, they felt their enjoyment of beauty interfered with by thoughts of its transience. This is a justly famous diagnosis. The revolts in their mind against mourning picks out a strategic but irrational mental activity. The mind anticipates the pain of mourning in the future over a loss and rushes forward in the present to attack the formation of any attachment that would make one vulnerable to loss. So far, so good. But let us think again about where the revolt in the mind against mourning is located. Purportedly, in the story, it's over there in the mind of the poet. But if we take a step back and ask, you know, take in the whole scene and we take a look at it, we, you know, we have one figure, the poet, who refuses to take pleasure in beauty so as to avoid the pain of mourning in the future. And we have another figure, the author or Freud, who in this scene is a cheerleader of transience. There is no ambivalence on either side and thus willingness to acknowledge and accept the pain of mourning has been completely left out of the scene. And that gives us reason to peek backstage, not to Freud as depicted in this scene, but to Freud the author, who, in depicting the scene, is leaving mourning out. This is a Freud who, as we are exploring, declared damage to his own ego, that is shattered pride and shattered admiration, in the context of world catastrophe. This damaged inner world depended on the illusion of the long trip, that one could participate in immortality somehow by identifying with civilization and its inevitable progress. The depicted scene, the standoff between poet and Freud, is from this perspective a first effort to restore ideals. It is a picture of an omnipotent battle. The poet will never have to suffer due to his high principle strategy, and for the Freud of this scene, transience only makes him more joyful. A battle of ideals is in play, but it is manic and fractured. However, this is an early stage of an attempted restoration. Freud turns to mourning, the phenomenon he thinks the poet is guarding himself against. And he says this, quote, mourning over the loss of something we have loved or admired seems so natural to the layman that he regards it as self-evident. But to psychologists, mourning is a great riddle, one of those phenomena which cannot themselves be explained, but to which other obscurities can be traced back. I am struck that Freud uses the word psychologist rather than psychoanalyst. And I wonder here if Freud is trying to create a restored ideal in which he might again take pride. In its broadest sense, a psychologist is one who can respond to pain and loss by, quite literally, giving a logos to the psyche. That is, 
an account of human being. The psychologist is one who can somehow transform loss into motivation for further inquiry about who we are. Here is the riddle as Freud presents it. Quote, we possess, as it seems, a certain amount of capacity for love, what we call libido. If the object of our love is destroyed, or if they are lost to us, our capacity for love, our libido, is once more liberated, and it can then take on other objects instead, or it can temporarily return into the ego. But why it is that this detachment of libido from its objects should be such a painful process is a mystery to us. And we have not hitherto been able to frame any hypothesis to account for it. We only see that libido clings to its objects and will not renounce those that are lost, even when a substitute lies ready to hand. Such then is mourning." Unquote. Now the choice of the Latin term libido now looks like an attempt to appear scientific according to the social conventions of the time. But what Freud is really talking about, as he tells us, is, quote, our capacity for love. His great riddle, as he puts it, concerns the pain that is internal to our love life, that is, to our actual loving. The point is that in falling in love with another, we become attached to them. We thereby make ourselves vulnerable to their vulnerabilities, and in particular, to the fact that they themselves are transient beings. Should they die, we do not just move on to someone else. We suffer their loss. It is this suffering that transforms what otherwise would be mere change into loss. This capacity for love thus turns us into historical beings in that we keep the past alive in emotion-laden, meaning-filled memories. We try to figure out what their lives have meant, what our lives have meant and mean. Our imaginations get busy. Suffering loss takes time, and that time is full of thoughts of past time. Freud is clear that we form attachments not only to other people, but to ideas and ideals, to nations and causes and peoples, to religious beings, God, angels, and spirits, to cultural achievements, natural wonders, and beauties. Through all of our attachments, we make ourselves vulnerable to loss. Indeed, we inadvertently make ourselves doubly vulnerable. For as we form our attachments, we are liable, without quite noticing what we are doing, to identify with them. That is, to take personal pride in, say, the purportedly continuous achievements of civilization. And should there be disillusionment with the ideal, we not only suffer that loss, we also, as it were, are snuck up from behind and have to suffer the unexpected loss of a piece of ourselves. Such then, says Freud, is mourning. He is speaking in the voice of the psychologist, which I believe is the voice of a refurbished ideal one that is created in the very act of formulating the psychologist's great riddle. This is itself an act of mourning, mourning the loss of a less robust ideal of civilization as an endless trip. In short, Freud is speaking from his own loss and suffering. His psychologist is not merely a member of a social profession, but an imaginary figure he can admire, aspire, and identify with a repair of a previously damaged ideal. We readers are in some sense caught up in Freud's love affair, in this case with the ideals to which one could love or identify. The English translation of this essay is on transience, and the preposition on suggests that the author takes himself to be writing on a topic, transience, from a respectable distance. It is the topic of, of, of a study. But the German title has no preposition. There's no on there. Uh, it is simply uh, Vergänglichkeit. Um, and if I were to take a uh, translator's liberty, I would not add a preposition, but I would rather add two punctuation marks at the end 
an exclamation point and a question mark. Transience? The essay is as much an expression of our feelings of transience as it is a study of it. There is no outside position from which to comment on it. There's no meta position available. As a native speaker, I want to record a different valence that I experience in the English words transience and change. Change is impersonal. Change happens. It also makes sense to us to talk about mere change. Transience, by contrast, signifies impermanence. And there's also the suggestion that our hearts are in it. Transience hints of loss. There is thus a wistfulness to transience that change does not have. If we can experience this valence, then Freud's essay poses a new version of the chicken and egg question. Do we mourn because of the transience of the world? Or is the world transient because we mourn it? Without there being beings like us, with our capacity to love in the way we do love, would there be only change? It is not that we impose transience on a world or that transience is merely a human projection. Rather, transience manifests itself in a world of lovers and lovables. Transience and mourning would seem to arise together. I am reading on transience as performance, a performance of psychic repair in the midst of world catastrophe. It is at the same time a transformation of the basic ideals through which we may relate to humanity and to eternity. And in conclusion, I shall try to make clear what I mean. At the end of his essay, Freud returns to the original scene of psychic loss, but now with a restored ideal. Quote, I believe that those who seem ready to make a permanent renunciation because what was precious has proved not to be lasting are simply in a state of mourning for what is lost. Mourning, as we know, however painful it may be, comes to a spontaneous end. When it has renounced everything that has been lost, then it has consumed itself, and our libido is once more free, insofar as we are still active and young, to replace the lost objects by fresh ones, equally or still more precious. It is to be hoped that the same will be true of the losses caused by this war. When once the mourning is over, it will be found that our high opinion of the riches of civilization has lost nothing from our discovery of their fragility. We shall build up again all that the war has destroyed and perhaps on firmer ground and more lastingly than before." Unquote. So who are these people Freud diagnoses as mourning? Those tempted to renounce civilization's achievements because of their fragility. I think it must be Freud himself and his intended readers. Or rather, it was Freud as he described his previous condition, a moment ago as it were, before performing the psychic repair of this very essay. There is something shocking about this conclusion, and it might be summoned up thus. Even mourning is transient. Freud's great riddle, as he presented it, is that we are creatures who mourn at all. We linger in pain and loss. The other side of that riddle is that after some time we move on. How could it be that, as it were, only moments ago, we were ready to renounce all of civilization's achievements because they had revealed themselves to be fragile, and now, only moments later, we are hoping for a better, more lasting civilization the next time around. In the depth of grief, it can seem that the grief itself is paltry in comparison to the depth of the loss. And yet, it is equally internal to mourning that at some point we return to life. Of course, mourning is not itself fickle. People's lives, personalities, memories, values, and commitments can be changed forever by the people with whom they fall in love and indeed by the causes they have come to love and identify with. Still, it is part of that great riddle that is mourning, not just that it should ever happen, but that part of what it is for it to happen is 
for it to come to an end at some point. And as is well known, Freud treated mourning as a sign of health. In his famous contrast of mourning with melancholia, it's the melancholic who is stuck in self-castigation, grief, fury, depression, and overall unhappiness. Mourners might in a moment or for a moment look similar, but they eventually emerge from this condition. But what does a return to life consist in in the midst of world catastrophe? Freud says, quote, it is to be hoped. And it is in these very words that Freud is himself expressing hope. He is doing this in the midst of catastrophe. The war is not over, yet his words mark the return of hope. And this return of hope is his emerging from mourning, mourning the loss of the ideal of civilization as never ending progress. War has destroyed that for him. Now, and for an enlightenment atheist like Freud, this is the secular equivalent of the death of God. Freud can no longer imagine himself as doing one's meaningful bit by participating in this image of eternity. But then how does one emerge from mourning? I wanna claim that Freud here installs an ideal of repetition that he cannot quite conceptualize as such. He expresses that hope that, quote, we shall build up again all that war has destroyed, unquote. Now, no one could mean that literally. We do not wish to bring back destroyed systems of injustice, exploitation, and evil. To that we say, good riddance. We are in fact hoping for their transients, the transients of the bad and the ugly and the unjust. They too are transient and thank goodness. Freud expresses the hope of building back up again all the good that catastrophe has destroyed, but maybe in this next repetition, it will be even better. The words Freud uses are, quote, perhaps on firmer ground and more lastingly than before. The hope acknowledges that we cannot be all that determinate about what we are hoping for. The hope then is as ironic as it is earnest. It's for a return, of the better. This is what it is for Freud to emerge from mourning the destruction of civilization. Now it might be surprising to see a positive conception of repetition in the writings of Freud. For in his explicit writings on repetition, the concept has a negative aura. The official Freudian conception of repetition is the condition of neurotics, people who fail to flourish. They unconsciously repeat fateful conflicts. For example, the person who cannot get his paper done on time, or the person who cannot commit to her relationship, or the person who is professionally successful, but again and again feels empty inside. It almost feels faded. There is even an intimation of eternity here that the repetition of the same is all there is. Freud does not formulate explicitly a positive conception of repetition but it is there to be found in his conception of mourning. Of course, the world may overwhelm us, it may destroy us, it may eliminate any chance of happiness or psychic well-being, it may make us miserable for the rest of our lives. But if it does not, then it is characteristic of us that we respond to loss with pain and suffering, but then tend in the direction of returning to life. The return is itself an expression of hope. We may not be able to say what we are hoping for, but in the broadest and most indeterminate sense, hope hopes for the good. So what we have here is a return of hope, which is itself a hope for the return of the good. From Freud's point of view, this is who we are when we are doing well. It seems to me now, writing in our time of pandemic, that Freud, writing in his time of world catastrophe, was struggling with issues of the legitimacy of imaginative life. In particular, he saw that longings for immortality could no longer be gratified by a fantasy of civilization's long trip. The substitute ideal, repetition, is admittedly more fragile. 
We are not guaranteed that our species is eternal or that a habitable world will last. Still, this acknowledgement can open room for more sustainable forms of fantasy and a good enough imaginative world. There is intimation of eternity in repetition, at least in this sense, that for as long as we endure, we shall keep returning with hope, a hope for the return of the good. And it seems to me that there is further hope to be gleaned from the recognition of the durability of hope that is internal to the human. But the nature of this durable yet vulnerable hope has been largely unexplored in psychoanalytic thinking about the human. Perhaps that is because the focus has been on pathology rather than a sustained attempt to understand what a healthy human imagination consists in. The only thinker I know of who has thought deeply about repetition in this good sense is Soren Kierkegaard. But for him, repetition was available only through Christian faith. And for me, thus, it's a question whether repetition can be understood in a wider context available to a wider range of people. It, it remains important unfinished business in the human understanding of the human to comprehend the scope, limits, and possibilities of repetition in this good sense. Perhaps the pandemic has opened up some opportunities for thinking about it and for understanding it in a new context. And I shall continue with this inquiry in the next lecture. Thank you. Thank you again, Professor Lear, for this engaging talk on transience, mourning, and indeed also on hope, critically important ideas during this remarkably challenging moment in our lives as individuals and as communities. And now we're happy to take some questions for Professor Lear. Thanks again, Jonathan, for fielding those questions. And again, thank you to David Wagner and Rini B. Adams for supporting the David Wagner Distinguished Lectureship in Humanistic Inquiry at the Newberry Library. And thanks to all of you for joining this evening. A recording of this program will be available on the Newberry's YouTube channel in a few days. Newberry programs remain free and open to the public thanks to the generosity of our donors. During this critical time, we need the support of the entire community. Please support the Newberry Library by making a gift today you can give online at newberry.org slash give. We look forward to welcoming visitors back to events at the Newberry as soon as it is safe to do so. In the meantime, please join us for our next virtual program in our Colonial History Lecture Series, Independence Lost, Lives on the Edge of the American Revolution with Kathleen Duvall on Wednesday, December 2nd at 4 p.m. Please also join us for the third and final lecture in this series on Wednesday, April 7th, 2021, when Professor Jonathan Lear will address the topic, Anxiety and Gratitude in the Time of Pandemic. You can register for this and other programs on our website, newberry.org. Thank you.